welcome back, Chamber family. For our new friends, my name is Al Ariola Jr. I'm President and CEO for the South Chamber and your host today. It's a pleasure to be here with each of you. On behalf of our board and members, I want to thank you for showing your support and being part of our audience. I want to thank our, some of our board members for joining us today. If you join me in thanking them as well. Suzanne Scott with the San Antonio River Authority. Our chair-elect for 2021, Robbie Brown of Documation. <laughs> Jessica Loudermilk of Texas A&M San Antonio. <laughs> Connie Gonzalez for Brooks. <laughs> I didn't see her yet, but Brianna Guevara with Spurs, Spurs, and, uh, Spurs, Spurs Sports and Entertainment, excuse me. Uh, Estrellita Garza Diaz, uh, Garcia Diaz with Jefferson Bank. I see you. Mr. Leroy Alloway from Via Metropolitan Transit. Rob Rodriguez from Verde Commercial Real Estate. Mr. Rob. And Mr. Joe De La Garza, our past chair and works at Jefferson Bank. Mr. Joe. Good to see you again, man. Uh, also, uh, board members from the San Antonio River Authority, thank you for being here with us. Uh, Ludis Garvan and Jerry Gonzalez. Hi, guys. Thank you very much. And our wonderful landlords, the great team at Brooks, uh, the board members that we have with us, Jim Campbell, Lorraine Pulido, and Roland Gonzalez. Mr. Jim, the chair. And of course, President and CEO, Mr. Leo Gomez. Thanks, sir. Thank you for being here. Also, some partners in our education space that we are grateful to have with us today. Uh, Dr. S Cynthia Tenete Matson from Texas A&M San Antonio, the president. And Mr. Gerardo Soto, Hollandale superintendent. Thank you for being here, sir. And of course, you're familiar with your chamber staff. Uh, Bobby, your VP of membership, Rodriguez. There's Bobby and Jessica, our VP of events. Uh, it's nice to have events, huh, Jess? Nice to do these again. Uh, again, thank you all for being here. I especially want to thank our presenting sponsor, Brooks. Thank you for presenting, being the presenting sponsor today for our special event. And also our silver sponsors, uh, Port San Antonio, the San Antonio River Authority, Documation, and Xenex Germ Zapping Solutions. Thank you very much for your sponsorship. So um, at this point too, I want to introduce Mr. Doug Harrison from Zenex Solutions. You can probably notice this nice robot next to me and one at the entrance. He's gonna explain a little bit about what we did today to keep you safe and show love and obviously keep you shopping south. So I wanna again thank you all for being here. Mr. Doug. Hi. It's okay if I have this off. Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. This is cool, a room full of real people and without little boxes around your faces. So I actually had to put on long pants instead of shorts to be on a Zoom call. So this is this a big day. But um, uh, Al, thanks for having us here. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, my name is Doug Harrison. I work with Zenex. Uh, we are headquartered here in San Antonio. This is the world's premier weapon, super weapon for killing superbugs. So we're here today to, to honor somebody that's been, been spent decades fighting for our country. Uh, and so Congressman, I'm, I'm honored to introduce you to this robot here named Courage. Uh, all of our robots have names. Uh, this is the world's preeminent device for killing any germs. We kill anthrax, Ebola, SARS, C. diff, MRSA, staph infections, E. coli. Oh, and that little virus thing that causes COVID, we kill that too. So it's been uh, through all the weird lockdown of business this year, it's been a banner year for Xenex for pretty dire reasons, but we've been trying to grow the business uh, with all of our, half our people working virtually. So it's been quite a challenge. Uh, the robot, uh, we had to run it before everybody got here, but it emits a ultra high powered UVC light that will kill any pathogen known to man. So you guys have the, the luxury of eating in your, your banquet dinner here in the most germ free area in all of Texas at this point today. Our, my senior robot over here, Steve Janes, it's with me, uh, has probably killed more actual coronavirus than 
almost anybody else in Texas except his partner that runs the other robots. But uh, we got here early this morning and zapped the entire room, the check-in table outside, all the chairs, everything. So if there are any germs in here of any type, much less the COVID virus, we killed all that. So uh, it's, it's, we're, we're very happy to be headquartered here in San Antonio. The, the company was started in a different place. Our founders are two Johns Hopkins epidemiologists, but we moved the company here. San Antonio has been a great environment for us to grow the business in. And uh, Congressman, we're happy to be here with you and in this beautiful germ-free ballroom now. But thanks for having us, and uh, we we'll look forward to hearing more from you. Thanks for all your service to our country. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Now I have the pleasure of introducing our honored guest. Uh, usually we read some of from his extensive bio. Uh, today I'm going to do something a little different. Um, we got a nice letter from the desk of President uh, Taylor Egmi from UTSA. And I, I don't think he's going to be shy. He shared this with staff, and I'm just going to share this too. I think these are nice thoughts that I think many of us in the room share as well. I understand that the South San Antonio Chamber of Commerce is hosting an event in your honor this week. And I am truly sorry that I am, I am unable to attend. I couldn't let the occasion pass without a personal note to express my deep appreciation for all that you have done for UTSA, the 23rd Congressional District of Texas, and our nation during your time on Capitol Hill. Since your very first day in office, your leadership, accessibility, and engagement have been unparalleled. I have unending gratitude for the many times you have served as an advocate for UTSA, and especially for your help for positioning our university as a national leader in cybersecurity. I'm sure Dr. Matson has some equal thoughts to share on that too. Uh, so many of us, uh, so many of our major initiatives would not have been uh, come to fruition without your support, like securing the $111 million Cybersecurity Manufacturing Innovation Institute from the U.S. Department of Energy, creating UTSA's National Security Collaboration Center and School of Data Science, which have secured more than $100 million in financial support to date. These initiatives will transform downtown San Antonio and directly impact our ability to serve as a driver of economic prosperity for our region. Launching Matrix, the UTSA Artificial Intelligence Consortium for well, Human Wellbeing, a research collaboration with UTSA Health San Antonio and Southwest Research Institute. Once more, you have given generously of your time to UTSA over the years, and we can't thank you enough for your presence and for sharing your insights with our community at several impactful events, like co-hosting the, their, their River on the Wall uh, film uh, 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 events at, on campus at UTSA, leading a May 2019 roundtable with NC, excuse me, NSCC partners to identify ways to grow and sustain San Antonio's cyber ecosystem and find innovative technologi technological solutions to issues of national security and defense. Co-hosting U.S. Secretary Rick Perry in the South Texas Energy Cybersecurity Forum held at UTSA and providing several remarks on the Matrix launch event in July of 2020. Throughout your tenure, you always found time to guide and support UTSA. I look forward to seeing where your national leadership journey takes you in the years to come. I think we all do. We stand ready to collaborate with you on future initiatives, especially those in support of our nation's security. He's also hoping you can join for them for a UTSA football game. But as I mentioned, many of us, I think, could substitute the word UTSA and, and have a lot of similar sentiments that what you did for our respective organizations and businesses. Um, I'm proud to call you a friend as well. I give you, ladies and gentlemen, Congressman Will Hurd. I'm going to try to put this. I'm going to try to put this back on here. We're living in absolutely crazy times. But I hope we remember how excited were we all when we walked up here to be like, man, we're going to be around other people. This is kind of fun. You know, a year ago, if you would have saw this on your calendar, you would have rolled your eyes and been like, I got to listen to Al one more time, all right? <laughs> But we, were, we, we realized over these last couple of months the importance of that connection and that kinship, right? And that fellowship and the need for camaraderie. And I hope once we get through this, because we are going to get through this, right? You know, we're going to be better off once we get out of this. But I hope we remember some of those lessons that, that we're learning now. Uh, when, when I reflect back on my time in Congress, 
You know, I, I'm, I'm on the board of the, of, I could take this off. Um, I'm on the board of the German Marshall Fund. German Marshall Fund is an organization designed to talk about the importance of the transatlantic relationship between the U.S. And, and, and Europe. And it was endowed by the German government in support of what George C. Marshall did, the Marshall Plan, rebuilt Europe, right? If it wasn't him, probably one of the, the greatest and most successful uh, development projects the U.S. has, has ever undertaken. And, and I'm on the board, and, and the German Marshall Fund is really a leader in disinformation. And we were talking about, yes, we know what the Russians tried to do in 16, what they tried in 18, what they continue to try in, in, in 2020. And this, this disconnect between eroding trust in our institutions, right? That's happening. Um, but, but they're not impacting the vote counting machines, right? We, we, we've taken a lot of steps in order to protect that. I held the first hearing on election interference before the 2016 election, by the way. Um, I helped write the legislation that actually gave money to secretaries of states to defend uh, that digital infrastructure, F F FYI. Um, but I, I was telling these folks, like, we need to look at what is that impact that these, this disinformation is having on, on actual voters. And they're like, how do we do that? And I was like, well, I'll show you some of my polls that I, that I used, right? And I pulled some materials from 2014 when I, when I won uh, the first time. You know what the number one issue in the 2014 election was? National security, specifically terrorism. More specifically than that, ISIS. That was at a time when ISIS was cutting people's heads off, right? Recording it. We, everybody was talking about the foreign fighter pipeline. You remember those conversations? When was the last time you heard the word foreign fighter or the phrase foreign fighter pipeline? You haven't heard in a couple of years, right? Because I, I was proud to work on, on you know, the direction from Mike McCall, fellow Texan, to address this issue of the foreign fighter pipeline. It was one of the first things I was able to do uh, when I was in Congress. And it was something that I can say, hey, we helped to make the country a lot more safe. Right? And ISIS tried to metastasize. Now, they're not completely gone, um, but they are no longer, they are a shell of who they were back in, in 2014. And, and I use that as an example in the moment Everybody was worried about how ISIS was, you know, using social media to influence people even if they were 6,000 miles away. And we were worried about ISIS inspiring attacks um, on our homeland. But guess what? In a very bipartisan way, we addressed that problem. And when's the last time y'all thought about ISIS, right? Probably it's been a couple years. And so, so we can solve big problems. We've been examples. I, 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 I had more legislation signed into law as a freshman than any other freshman in the history of Congress. That's actually been fact checked. And, and that was in the most competitive seat in Congress with a Democratic president. Now, it got even more tricky when Speaker Pelosi became the speaker because she didn't want me to have any successes. Um, my total of legislation signed the law would probably be higher than what it is, but I had to take my name off of a few because if my name was on it, it was definitely not going to move. Um, but we were able to do that because we solved real problems and we had partners in doing that. The only way this country has ever gotten big things done is by doing it together. Right? And that's something that I've tried to follow. And, and guess what? I learned that from living in San Antonio, Texas. Right? I've learned that from seeing how things operate here on the south side, on the north side where I grew up. San Antonio is actually a model for the, the rest of the country. Right? And so I've tried to learn those things I learned as a kid growing up in San Antonio and apply those to my six years in, in Washington, D.C. And it, it, was, it was a great experience, but the things that I'm going to remember the most are the people that we were able to actually help. You know, one of the, the times, you know, I, I know, and, and, and Dr. Amy, you know, said this in his letter, the, the number of appropriations bills and the amount of money that we were able to help and get in, in, into San Antonio, into West Texas, you know, that's big, it's gonna impact these communities. But the, I, I'm gonna forget those numbers 
right? Um, I, we haven't kept track really that much, Stacy. I know Stacy gets mad sometimes. So I'm like, how much did we do that one time? And then she has to get through her, her notes. And by the way, um, Stacy's here. Taylor, Taylor's here. Who else is here from the team? Just two of you. Y'all stand up for me, please. Give these ladies a round of applause, right? Stacy, Stacy started as an intern in Washington, D.C., came down to San Antonio to run the Southside office, now runs all of my operations in the state of Texas, right? And so the successes that many people attribute to me, uh, I have no responsibility in, to be frank. It was my team. And, and so I am lucky to have had, over these last six years, some amazing people that have worked tirelessly on y'all's behalf, right? And so when y'all congratulate me, you're actually probably congratulating about 50 to 75 people that over the years have contributed uh, to the 23rd. But the things I will remember, is people like a, a young woman named Stephanie. She was di diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And she struggled to find treatment options in the US she had to pass a law in the state of Texas to get access to the kinds of, 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 of treatments that she needed. And then she, the, 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 the treatments she was finally able to get um, impacted her ability to put weight on her legs. So she needed a standing wheelchair, right? Now, the only problem with the standing wheelchair is Medicare doesn't reimburse for that. There's like 10 kinds of wheelchairs. Medicare reimburses nine of the 10. She needed a 10th. And she reached out to our office and was like, can you help us? And we said, we don't know, right? But we were able to figure out, work on the issue, and to be frank, a couple of uh, months later, Stephanie got that wheelchair. We were able to change the law so that she was able to get access to that wheelchair. And fixing it for Stacy, we, Stephanie, we were, able to, we were gonna be able to fix that for thousands of, of people. Right? Those are the stories that, that I'm gonna remember, right? When, and when I forget all these other things that we spent a lot of time, energy, and, and effort on. And that's the, the kind of, of service that I've tried to deliver for this, my hometown but also the great state of Texas. I don't remember when it happened in our culture where we define ourselves by our political label. That didn't exist when I was a kid. That wasn't a thing when I was in Texas A&M. When I was an undercover officer in the CIA chasing terrorists around the world, I didn't know what my colleagues were or who they voted for. I don't know at what point we decided that the most important thing about ourselves is our freaking political party, right? Not our, not our culture, not our, you know, where we came from, right? And, and, and what, what, what blows me away is a lot of times people say I'm a moderate. For those that know me well, you know I hate labels, right? Don't put baby in the box, right? Don't tell me, you know, don't tell me who I am, what I am, what I can do, right? I, I've bristled against that my entire life. And the word moderate actually bothers me, right? Because it, moderate sounds like lukewarm. And to me, the one person that has had to take the hardest votes in Congress is yours truly. And I like to say I'm principled because I behave the same way when my party's in power than when my party's out of power. And not everybody can agree, can, can say that they did that. And that's one thing that I've tried to do. I made a commitment to all the folks that I represent that you're going to see me, number one. I had heard from the previous before me, we never saw. That's why I spent so much time crisscrossing the district. My car has 185,000 miles on it. Um, and that started in 2014. That doesn't include all the rental cars or Stacy's car, <laughs> you know. Uh, Stacy's car probably has that many. Uh, make sure you get your, your forms to get reimbursed before, before the end of the year, um, uh, Stacy. But I also said, you're going to see me, but you're not always going to agree with me. And, and I've tried to, to, to 
And what I've learned in that process, y'all don't expect to agree with me 100% of the time, right? But you want to know where I'm coming from and why I'm doing things. And that's what I've tried to do over these, these last six years. And some of these things, like making sure the mission reach gets reimbursed, right? Everybody's on board with that, right? I don't think there was any anti, you know, getting that money. So we were able to solve that. Solve that. But there was other, a little more controversial. And what the, the phrase I prefer, now that wasn't a moderate that did that, right? I call it pragmatic idealism. How do you solve and address the issues you're dealing with right now to benefit the, the greatest amount of people possible? And that requires two things. It requires aspirational leadership. It means your leaders are trying to take us to a better place, right? That we're going to be bigger, we're going to be greater, we're going to be stronger. But it also requires responsible citizenship. Are you going, you know, we were all taught, don't get into a car with a stranger, asterisk, unless it's Uber or Lyft now, right? Why are y'all sharing stuff from people on social media that you don't know who they are? And contributing to this? Why are y'all saying nasty things on social media because you would wash your kid's mouth out if they said that in person? Yeah, we can clap for that. <laughs> right? Are we modeling the behavior that we want to see from our elected officials? Right? This is not, we can't blame the people that are running for office. The only people we can control are ourselves, right? And we gotta be responsible leadership. We gotta be responsible citizens, excuse me. And, 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 and if we realize this little experiment we call America was based on allowing the greatest amount of freedoms possible. Because when you allow freedom, that means you're gonna have opportunity. When you have opportunity, that leads to growth. And when you are growing, you are progressing. That is why this experiment has worked. And that is why we need folks to engage at every level to make sure that this experiment continues. We need the federal government and the private sector to work together. My last, I hope, I, you know, Stacey's gonna get mad at me because I don't like making um, statements that I don't know I can complete. Why do I talk about artificial intelligence and cybersecurity? We are in a generational defining challenge with the government of China on who is going to show global leadership in this world on advanced technologies like artificial intelligence. Everyone in this room should care because everyone here is going to be impacted by it. Now, Stacey, remember, I'm, I'm, I'm like off the notes, by the way. I'm going. She's supposed to keep me on time. So, uh, uh, you know, you haven't given me any signals yet. Um, so, so, if we do not continue American leadership in advanced technology, our economy is going to be impacted. Our way of life is going to be impacted. And the Chinese government has made it very clear. By 2049, they're going to surpass the United States of America as a, as the glo as a global hegemon in the world. That's not my interpretation or me musing about that laying in my bed at night. That's what they have said about themselves. Now, are we going to be able to marshal all of our resources in academia, in government, in the private sector to meet this challenge? Or are we going to sit and have silly fights on Twitter about stupid shit that has nothing to do, pardon my language, on, on how do we in ensure that our children and our children's children are going to make this, keep this the greatest country on the planet? These are the questions we should be trying to debate. And Stacy is already wrapping me up. I feel like I'm just getting started. She gave me two minutes. I'll take five, maybe. Um, Al, am I good? I'm good? OK. Um, one of my, one of, I'm sorry I'm all over the place. I'm actually just excited to be here with everybody, you know? <laughs> Y'all look good, you know? Um, it's great being out here with you. And it's, it's apropos that this is like one of my uh, final 
probably, I don't want to say that. We still got three months. Um, I got to pass that national strategy on AI, so we're going to be needing some of y'all. Um, one of my favorite things in, in Congress is an interpretation of a famous painting. It's Washington crossing the Delaware, right? Y'all know that. Y'all know that painting of George Washington in battle dress at the front of that boat, a little boat. Looks invincible, right? Well, most people don't realize that painting was painted 75 years after the events it depicts. Um, it depicts the event of Washington crossing Delaware Christmas 1776, Christmas Eve 1776. And it was, it was painted 75 years after that event in Germany by a German. Germany was going through their own civil war and this cat was like, look, I'm going to use my skills to, to empower my countrymen and I know how to paint, so I'm going to paint a picture of some real revolutionaries. The Delaware River doesn't look like that, by the way. The picture is totally historically inaccurate. The boat is too small for the 13 people that are in it. Well, you can only see 12, by the way. And there's two farmers in it. There's two French guys in it. There's a German dude, there's a black dude, there's a Native American, there's a woman dressed up like a man. <laughs> True story, check it out. And then there's a 13th hand. And you don't know who that 13th hand is, right? And <clears throat> this painting, the original painting, makes it look like, oh, this is a fait accompli. People fighting on behalf of inalienable rights. Of course they're going to win. But when you think about how improbable their task was, you appreciate what we as a country or a future country was trying to do. Now, I don't love this painting because it is a, 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 a painting or a representation of an important moment in our history. I actually believe this is a painting about our future. And that the only way we're going to do that thing that nobody thinks can be done, is if we all appreciate and recognize that we're in this little boat together. And, and that's something that I've learned from interacting with many of y'all, right? That is something that I've learned from my time serving my country, whether it's in the CIA or, or in Congress, and that is something that I'm going to continue to do, and I'm looking for, I, everybody comes up to me acting like I'm dying. I'm not dying, I'm okay. I have lost some weight. Thanks for those of y'all that, that noticed. Um, but I'm looking forward to continuing working on these important issues of national security right, and technology, working on things like healthcare, right? My friend Tony Gonzalez is here. He died on a freaking table getting a hernia, and somebody made a mistake. Right? That shouldn't happen. I have people that are, I know people that are dealing with issues right now of mental health and they can't get access to doctors unless they put a gun in their mouth. That's insane. Our system should not be that way. And the only way we're going to solve it if we work together. Anyways, that's the, Stacey's giving me the, you know, that's it. So, so it has been an honor representing the 23rd District of Texas, representing uh, the South Side Chamber. I have how many more weeks, Stacy? We got a uh, month and a half, two months, right? She's like, no, we're done. We're not taking any more applications. Um, um, we're gonna run through the tape. We have a lot of legislative things to do, right? And we're gonna obviously continue uh, to work and take care of problems and fight for our constituents who need to be fought for. So it's been a, a pleasure. It's wonderful being here with all y'all. God bless you, and may God continue to bless these United States. Of America. Thank you, sir. I think we have time. I think we have time, yes. Where's my mask? Hey, hey, if I could keep you up there, a, a well-deserved uh, standing ovation. I think we, Stacy was cutting you off because we do have time for some Q&A. Okay, yeah, yeah. And so uh, I, I don't think you were all over the place. I think you were very 
how about this? We know all the great accomplishments you did within the district, and we're grateful for those. But I'm also grateful for these words of, of how to look towards the future and as Americans. And so that's, I think, an incredibly important I, message I, nowadays. I broke from my Henry Cuellar. You know, I love Cuellar. When Cuellar shows up, he has this parchment of, like, here's all the things I've done, you know. And, and, and I will say this. Henry has been a great partner and is someone that doesn't get enough credit for what he does. Everyone knows him as a Laredo congressman, but he does so much for us. Yes, right? he does. And he has, he has really been a, a great partner. Well, both of you are, are pillars of what it is to work together uh, beyond partisanship, so I thank you both for your leadership. All right, uh, so, any questions? We've got time for one or two, maybe I'll three. I'll take, a pearl, I'll take a pearl of wisdom. I've got know, one right so, here. Uh, up, Do me a favor and introduce yourself, sir. Will Garrett with Port San Antonio. Congressman, how you doing? What's up, buddy? Doing great, man. I think I'd say on behalf of the port and really the broader cybersecurity ecosystem, thank you for being accessible, for being here, for frankly listening to what industry said and making things move. Um, I'm going to go on something you're not passionate about, and that's the national strategy on AI. Mm -hmm. um, I think San Antonio is always looking, and COVID's made it a little bit harder, how do we get involved? How do we plug in? Maybe not what the outcomes will be, but if you ran the world, Will, what is that strategy going to look like? How does the private sector, when we have Dr. Matson here, Dr. Amy wrote the letter, we have some amazing university R&D work going on. I guess, how can we get prepped to plug into that strategy, double down on kind of the strengths we have in cybersecurity and AI, and make sure we're playing a role in that? Sure. Um, so why does AI matter? Hey, you can't talk about AI without talking about 5G, you can't, and you can't talk about without talking about quantum computing, right? 5G first. Yeah, it's gonna be awesome to download season three of The Boys in like two seconds on my phone, right? But that's not what, what is interesting. When you do something on your phone, you do some kind of, uh, uh, you make some command on your phone, it goes in the cloud, it comes back. The amount of time that takes is called latency. With 5G, we're gonna be able to do it under 10 nanoseconds. Why does 10 nanoseconds matter? Our thoughts, are in like seven or eight nanoseconds. So we're gonna have the entire computing power of the internet in our hands, in real time. What is that gonna allow us to do? I don't know, right? <laughs> have some ideas, actual driverless cars, all those kinds of things. And then once you have all this data and this ability to access this data as quickly, and that data is in the cloud, then you're gonna be able to use machine learning and algorithms in order to do things with it, right? You're gonna be able to monitor um, the salinity of soil to figure out how you can grow more crop with less water, with less energy, and with less land, right? Like, how much that's going to save us, it's going to reduce our CO2 footprint, all those kinds of things. It's going to also allow us to have someone who may be vision impaired request a car and be able to get from point A to point B and get to work without having to go through a complicated system. Right? It's going to allow my elderly parents to be able to potentially have a smart house where they're not worried about falling. Right? So those are all the different kinds of applications that this could have. And then quantum. Quantum, you know, I, I, I'm getting in, in Tony's area now since he's a cryptologist. Most people think of quantum, it's going to be able to break all the encryption we can potentially use right now. Right? That's scary. Why are the, the, the Chinese and the Russians, they're sucking everything out of the air? and storing it. Because once they have a proper quantum computer, they're going to be able to crack all those codes, read all of our old secrets, right? But it's also going to enable us to have a speed and be able to do things with modeling of, of, um, of molecules that are going to allow us to make better materials. So imagine you're an astronaut, and you can have a suit that is one one hundredth of the weight, but have a 100% increase in protecting you from UV rays, right? How is that going to help us out in space? But here down here, right, imagine being able to make cheaper blankets for people that are homeless, right? Th these are the, some of the, 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 the things that we're going to be able to use. And in order to get to that point, the Chinese are beating us, period, end of story. Nobody likes it when I say that, because guess what? They have more data than we do. And they don't care about civil liberties. They don't care about privacy. They're putting Uyghurs, an ethnic minority group, in concentration camps today. And is the rest of the world outraged by this? 
Not sufficiently, in my opinion. So when you have a country that doesn't care about data, that can force all levels of, of, of society to work into one de destination, you can get there first. So they can do more research, and they're already putting more dollars in research. That's why what Dr. Matson's going to do and, and making sure they have, re have resources to do more research and also develop the leaders of the future, right, to be able to be practitioners in artificial intelligence is important. So it's a long setup to your question. We need, there is no such, is, you, none of y'all know a computer science teacher that's chilling at a coffee shop waiting to get a phone call. Right? We just don't have enough teachers to educate our kids. So we need to train our teachers, and I think we should, I think we should go as early as elementary school, but most people are comfortable with seventh grade, introducing coding into seventh grade and algebra and other classes. So that requires us to be able to train those teachers, but it also requires people that have some of these skills to be available to those teachers in order for them to help improve their curriculum. Right? So that's one way. Are, are y'all, do, how many of y'all have internship programs? That's great, y'all are above, y'all are first in class. Now, are your interns gonna contribute to the bottom line? No. Okay, I remember when I was an intern, I was an intern at Southwest Research. I'm quite, I, I don't know how I got the job because my only technical skill at that point was I could type 60 words a minute, right? And I'm quite confident I didn't contribute to the bottom line, but it inspired me to go into technology and do computer science. Right? So are we inspiring uh, those kids to go to Texas A&M San Antonio, to go to UTSA in order to do, do something in STEM? Right? So that's another area. And then when it comes to sharing data, the public and the private sector should be working together on this. I, I can go all, all day, Will, and, and you know, y'all, you and all your iterations since I've known you has been, has been helpful to what we do. Sorry, Al. No, no, that's a good answer. I think we have Who's another next? question. Don't mind introducing yourself for the folks at home, sir. Talking about public-private partnerships, you know, the, the key. Howdy, Congressman. And, um, I don't have a question. Mm. I have a thank you. Mm. And it's a little project, relatively speaking. But thanks to you, today, Sarah, Brooks, the county, and the railroad companies with their cooperation, we're actually connecting Brooks to the San Antonio River, to the World Heritage Sites, and to downtown. It's only a little quarter mile stretch, but it was a challenge and it would have been a shame had we not been able to connect a developing community like we are here at Brooks with those wonderful assets in South San Antonio. Mm -hmm. Your leadership, sir, got that little project going and it's literally under construction and I look forward to having you at the ribbon cutting when we open up that trail. Thank you for hey, having me. I wanna drive the stake, us. man. Yeah. I, you know, come out, I'm gonna do the, th thank you, Leo. Look. Um, the projects I've, I've been able to get involved have been, have been, have been great. And, and learning about uh, what's happening in San Antonio. Uh, uh, Suzanne's gonna get mad at me. I, I always talk about Lake Mitchell. You know, are, are my friends, where, is Saws here? They, they, they hate it when I call it, that when I say it, it used to be a cesspool, right? That's not the appropriate term to use. That's like an old fashioned term for what it was, but it was a cesspool and now, it is a, one of the greatest birding locations in South Texas. Stacy's getting mad because she knows what's next. I've become a birder. That's true. It's true. Um, and the fact that there's like 10,000 pelicans, like in, a, in, I think it's October, in Southside San Antonio. Like, what? You know, I didn't know that. Um, and so, so it's been fun, some of those projects, right? I think that camera is Al's. So yeah, we, 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 we do have an audience yeah. at home. And for, for our for our audience at home, the, the previous comments were for Leo Gomez, the president and CEO of Brooks, and right now I have Suzanne Scott. Um, well, do I still announce you as? Well, you're, I'll let you introduce yourself. Okay. Hi. I'm Suzanne Scott, general manager of the San Antonio River Authority, and we also want to say thank you so much for everything you've done for the Mission Reach. I know that many people in this community know that getting that reimbursement back from the federal government, even though we we're very entrepreneurial in the way that we did that Mission Reach project and really advanced the county's funds in order to get that project done faster and cheaper than it would have been if we had to wait for the federal government to put their money in. You have been such a champion to make sure that that money that we, the county, uh, advanced came back to this community and is now being reinvested in the San Pedro Creek project and eventually other projects. So thank you very much for that. 
Also, I have to say, uh, as it related to that, thank you so much for bringing Chairman Simpson here. Uh, that was an awesome opportunity for us to really talk to a chairman from Idaho about how important it, how our a little bird on our mission reach is connected all the way up to his community and I thought it brought it home for him and now you know of course he and his staff advocated along with you to get the money to come back here so I want to say thank you for that and also on behalf of the National Park Service I don't think they're here they just got a new uh, superintendent no. I have to say thank you so much for the work that you've done to bring home that bill to make sure that our uh, national parks throughout the country and particularly those in Texas, are now have funds, a dedicated amount of funding for maintenance for our national parks. This is an extremely important effort that you were such a champion on. Even when it wasn't so popular, you were there. So thank you so much. No, it's, it's my pleasure. Al, Al, I could do this all day if you want. You know? Yeah, we uh, No, look, so, so some of y'all have heard this story. When, when, um, when I was a kid, we went on one family vacation. And it was the Corpus Christi. I think I was like seven. And I was super excited to go into the water and the beach. And I run out, and I'm in my little red swim trunks, run out in the water, and immediately get stung by a, a jellyfish. Right? So I don't go back to the beach until I was 22. And, and, and I had never been to national parks. I had never, you know, they, they, you know we had some woods behind our house. That's the closest it, it, it came. And, and I didn't think when I was first running for Congress that I would become a champion for national parks because I didn't know that I had an eight, nine, nine in the, in, in the, in the district, and then become a co-chair of the, of the National Parks Caucus. And what, what's fascinating to me is, is have, having learned that you know, nature is not a destination, right? It's our home. And, and we have some great resources right here in, in San Antonio and to be able to protect those and make sure, and, and, and the bill um, that Suzanne's talking about was just in Texas alone, there was a billion dollars worth of backlog maintenance. And across the country, I think the number is 14 billion. And, and we were able to, to identify a, a funding stream to make sure that we start ensuring that those projects get taken care of so that for another 100 years, National Park Service is 100 years old, that for another 100 years, we're going to have these parks that for our kids and our grandkids and great-great-grandkids continue to go to. So, so, but, but this is an example of the advocacy. I didn't know that stuff, right? But y'all coming up to D.C., Y'all grabbing me when I'm in San Antonio to go see those things, right? That, and then being able to bring y'all up to San Antonio. Sometimes these trips to, to DC are a little bit pain in the rear. And sometimes y'all get frustrated because like, I feel like I'm saying the same thing to the same people, right? But that advocacy is what is helpful in order to get some of these projects done. And so I, I you know, all of these things that we've been able to be successful in accomplishing in, in Congress has been because there have been local advocates that come up and help us and, and make sure these things get done. And, and I think our work together with Sarah is, is a perfect example of that. And that's a model for other folks when y'all are working on a legislation or, or projects that are important for our community. So I got one more for you. Uno más. Introduce yourself to My BFF. I'm Hello, I'm Cynthia Teniente Matson, the president at Texas A&M San Antonio. Thank you, Congressman Hurd, for being such an exemplar of a proud Aggie graduate, uh, using his leadership skills at every moment, at, at every spot. I want to thank you personally for introducing me to Alex Stamos, and that led to some great collaborations with Facebook, for bringing the um, Opportunity Zone conversations right to the a and campus where those uh, processes and policies were structured that have helped so many of us, including Leo and some of his, he had the first project here on the South Side using the Opportunity Zone funding, and so many other things. And I know we're, we're looking forward to you teaching at A&M San Antonio. But I have a question for you that I know near and dear to your heart, and maybe your comments about how you think about the digital divide now. We've known about these things before, and as I've been saying publicly, a lot of the digital divide is hitting in the heart of South Bear County, the heart of the areas that you represent. We've known about it. Now we can't unsee it. How do you think about this from a longer-term policy perspective? I know what we're doing at A&M to help uh, solve this, but this is really much what you and I have talked about before in public policy debates and discussions. 
How do you see this around the corner? Yeah. So you have income inequality because you have education inequality. And if you, if you make um, education inequality worse, that income inequality is going to get worse. And so we have learned um, how important this issue of access to digital tools is now, especially now in, um, uh, in COVID-19. Uh, at, at the beginning of the school year, like a third of, of students couldn't get access, right? Um, in the middle of the seventh largest city, cyber city, cybersecurity city USA, couldn't get access to the freaking internet? right like that's crazy and so how do we address this because the 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 haves and the have nots are, are going to get even more extreme if we don't do this especially as we start talking about new technologies like 5g ai and, and quantum and so so part of the idea is there's a there's a there's a, a an issue of called fixed wireless that we don't get enough conversation about we always think that everything should be um a cable or fiber optic cable um the technology is evolving to, to a point where fixed wireless as a solution may, may, may be the place to do that. We can do that in certain communities, and we can do that in rural areas. Uh, we have to have this concept of dig once. If TxDOT is building a road somewhere, you better lay a freaking cable wire down in there. If you don't, right, there's, there's something wrong with that. So, so dig once, because we know that resource is going to be able uh, to, to be used. And then can you create unique ways of having potentially school districts play the role as like an ISP, right? Because the, the economics may not sen make sense of, of providing that first, that last mile of getting from, you know, that hub at the highway to that home, but a, a school district could potentially be able to do that, right? And so, so who is providing access to that? Right, is one way that we could potentially work on this problem. And, and it, is, it, is, it is really, um, my father's 87 years old. And um, every time I go to his house, he, has, he always has a, he'll have like a little note for me. Right? And the other day he wrote, he, it was, what's the name of that, that gangster movie with Al Pacino on Netflix? No, the, the newer one, anyone? What? The Irishman. He had a note in his notepad that just said, the Irishman. I said, what's that, Pops? He's like, how do, I, how do I get that movie? I was like, oh, let me show you how to get Netflix, right? Now, we take it for granted being able to ac access Netflix on our computer, on, on, the, on the TV, right? And you could probably go to any TV and be able to do that. But my father had never had to use, to think through the arrows on, the, on the, the remote corresponds with the cursor on the screen, right? Now, it was, it was, it's kind of a pseudo funny story to tell now, but that is an example of, of how all of us are gonna feel at some point. And if we're not making sure that these young kids have these tools, um, I was with Saha, when was that? A month ago, when we were giving out those computers, right? San Antonio Housing Authority said, hey, uh, we're, we're, half people are working from home. We have all these, laptops, all these desktops. We're going to give these desktops to, to, to kids in, 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 in homes that need them. And I'm out there giving out the, lap, the, the, the desktops. And I asked this one kid, he goes, this is my first computer. He was a senior in high school. I said, what do you like? How do you do your papers? He said, on his phone. I said, on your phone? Like you're typing a, a, an English paper on your phone? Like that's crazy, okay? I, I, look, I have had access to computers in seventh grade. So anyways, these are the problems we have to address, and I'm gonna end with this story. The month after I was born, Voyager 1 went into space. Voyager 2 actually went into space. And it was the first man-made object that has gone into interstellar space, right? We learned so much about our universe from Voyager 2. When, I was, when, when Al and I were in school, Pluto was a planet, right? It's not a planet anymore, you know? 
Um, and I, I've been told by NASA it's never going to be a planet um, again. And, and we learned so much about our solar system and our universe from Voyager 2 that was put up in September of 1976. You know what the onboard memory was? Four kilobytes. That's not even a Word doc. That is 800 characters, 800 words. That's like half a Word doc. And, and that is what, and it's still reporting back today. That was 43 years ago. The technological change we're going to see in the next 43 years is going to make the last 43 years look insignificant. And if we don't have political leadership that can work together to solve these challenges, if we don't have responsible citizens that are willing to demand that kind of behavior from our elected officials, if we don't have public and private sector working together to solve these challenges, and if we don't have great universities educating our workforce for the future, we're not going to win the struggle that we're in. But I'm an optimist because I look out at people like y'all that are grinding and trying to work on these problems every single day. And I just want to thank y'all for what you do. God bless y'all. Thank you, Congressman Hurd. So if I could take, I guess, a point, a little minute of, of personal privileges. I am a product of District 23. I was born and raised in, in Del Rio, Texas. And certainly throughout the past, your tenure in Congress, we, we have seen a very interesting time in our country, as you kind of described, about just talking at each other versus with each other. But I think District 23, young men like me had someone to really look up to. And I think you did excellent work throughout the district, and especially for us here in San Antonio and my folks even in Del Rio, Texas. So Congressman, I can't thank you enough. Again, it's a pleasure to call you a friend. I know this might be the end of a congressional era for you, but I have a feeling we're only about to see bigger and better things from you. So thank you so much for your service, sir. <clears throat> So that being said, too, Stacy also keeps us on, 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 on task, is we are told uh, ethics rules, you know, only $25 or something like that we can give you. So what we decided to do, and we know you're a birder, is uh, we have a reservation for you come January 2021. Whenever you want to come after you know, you're done with Congress, uh, a reservation for you here at the Embassy Suites for a weekend and also for the Salt Cave uh, Tour 2 and just for you to pamper yourself and enjoy, uh, hopefully a little bit of a break before you get back to work. So thank you, sir. <laughs> So I want to thank all of you, especially for joining us today. For those tuned in on our audience, thank you for joining us as well. I especially want to thank, once again, our presenting sponsor, Brooks. And please also give a big shout out to Documation and Xenix for going out of the way to keep us safe today. I hope you did feel safe. Uh, I hope you are ready for more events, because we're going to bring them. And so again, thank you for being here. Thank you.